at least half of all organisations uh, that we know today, that perhaps we want to work for, or we already work for, uh, will be dead or bought out by the end of this decade. So at least 50% of all organisations in the UK economy uh, will be gone by 2020. You're an intelligent crowd. You don't need me to tell you about the reasons uh, why we have immense volatility in our business environment. Social, economic, environmental factors. The Wall Street Journal refers to this as the age of fear. The Harvard Business Review calls it the decade of hell. Not exactly mobilising us into action. Um, I would like to think that this is actually a decade of immense opportunity, of change. What an exciting time to be around. Put simply, organisations can either adapt or they can die. The current prevailing business paradigm is no longer fit for purpose. There's a gentleman uh, that contributed a lot to the thinking of businesses in the 80s and 90s, Professor Michael Porter. You may know him, a lot of his models. <clears throat> he recently stood up and spoke to a number of business leaders in New York. And he said, the old models of corporate strategy and capitalism are dead. We are witnessing a paradigm shift, and notice his choice of words here, from hurting to helping, where the externalities become opportunities. The very things that we're taught at business schools or within our businesses to push off our balance sheets, the externalities, are the very things that are the opportunities that are going to enable us to transform. Now, that's interesting. Let me give you an example, just to bring it alive in the room, um, of an externality. I'm sure most of you know, but uh, it's, it's worth bringing alive. How much percentage of materials, so materials coming from nature, everything comes from nature in its origin, so from source goes into the final product at the point of sale. And this is for durables, yeah? So it's not for perishables like sandwiches and so on, but durables like coats, tables, mobiles, mobile phones, etc. And let's take the most efficient economies in the world, in the Western paradigm, the German economy, Japanese, the American, yeah? So, hands up, who thinks 60% of the materials will be in that product at point of sale? Hands up, who thinks 60%? Okay, how much of the goods that go into a product, making a product, from raw materials will still be in that product at the, the, the time that you buy it, when it's in the shop? Yeah? Does that... Uh, how much is lost along the way is another way of saying it, and probably a better way of saying it, maybe. Yeah? Still, I'm not quite sure if you think of um, gold, then for every... Age. The other day, for every kilogram of gold, they've dug up, I don't know, 10 tonnes or is it 15 tonnes of, of earth and material? Yeah, it's the other... There, you're down to almost zero percent. OK, OK. So I'm talking about um, the, uh, the materials that you extract, like gold, that get them to a point where they would be used in the manufacturing process and so not the wastes that's produced at the mining end. Yeah? So it's probably an important clarification. Does that help? Yeah? So all of the uh, key ingredients that go into the manufacturing process. Are we comfortable with that before I go ahead with the questions? Yeah? So 60%. I think everybody, no one's putting up hands for 60%. 40%. 25%. 25%. OK, OK. We're, we're in now. People are alive. <laughs> 10%. So it's about half and half. It's actually, unfortunately, slightly less than 10%. So how efficient is our economy? Maybe we're measuring the wrong thing. Ray Anderson, I quote him because he was the former chairman and CEO of Interface. Um, and you're going to hear from Kelly after me. He said the following. We have been and still are in the grips of a flawed view of reality, a flawed paradigm, a flawed worldview. It pervades our culture, putting us on biological collision course with collapse. It's the paradigm that is reflected in our culture's infatuation with stuff 
and our willful ignorance of nature. So quiet in here, we can hear you undoing your jacket. <laughs> our culture's infatuation with stuff and our willful ignorance of nature. The reality is, we are so inured, so hopelessly dependent upon the system that we will fight to protect it. Now, many of you will probably know Gregory Bates, and I brought this in for the Schumacher crowd. <laughs> the creature that wins against its environment destroys itself. Our sense of separation from nature corrupts us. It fuels an arrogance a hubris, whereupon common sense becomes insanity. I love that last bit. Where common sense, what we take as common sense, is actually insanity. This is our current paradigm. So, on a lighter note. I'm going to quote Alan, Alan Moore, if I may, because um, Alan, Alan, uh, it's been great working with you this week, Alan. We've been doing a, a course together on the radical redesign of business. And um, he, he, there was a, a line he used early on in the course, which was um, uh, that we fear change in our culture and that actually we need to be curious of change. And it's this shift, being curious of the unknown, being playful with transformation itself. Apparently, according to psychologists and, and so forth, that we change for two fundamental reasons. We change either that we've learnt enough that we want to change, that there's enough information uh, to enable us to change, or we're hurting so much that we have to change. So I put to you that this perfect storm of social, environmental and economic factors that we are now faced in is actually a perfect dawn for change because we've got ample evidence, perhaps excessive evidence, that we should be changing. And we're certainly hurting enough in all parts of the world and also in our own economy that we would want to change. Unfortunately, the re reality in businesses today makes it quite difficult, makes it a challenge. This is when you speak to, to business managers, um, in the workplace is, is, is unfortunately what's happening. People have been pulled in different directions. Often business leaders and, uh, and, and managers and, and people of all levels of the organisation uh, know that they need to change, know that milking this dying cow is not the right approach for business. And yet they're stuck in it. They've got quarterly returns, they've got targets, and they just put more and more pressure on people. And hence why we've got stress, we've got burnout, we've got people leaving, all, all sorts of situations happening in business. Now, I thought I would bring some brands into Schumacher College. I know that's potentially contentious here. Um, but the uh, reason why I want to do this is not to sort of say that these brands are great, because to be honest with you, there's, there's more interesting transformational, radical transformation stories happening outside brands. Um, but I think it's important to show what's happening within the existing paradigm within big business. So Unilever, Paul Polman, um, interesting chap. He, he, he's, he's set about transforming Unilever. He recently stood up whilst um, um, talking to the markets and said, I will not pander to the short-term wishes of the stock market. I'm going to purge the shareholders of Unilever, letting go of those that are only interested in the short-term value uh, and price of Unilever, and I'm going to go out and attract people who are interested in the long-term value creation potential of Unilever, because that's what I'm interested in. He went on to say, it would be e easy for me to jack up the share price of Unilever and in two years' time go sailing around the Bahamas. Now, isn't that perhaps the mentality of a lot of business people today? And that's not because business people are different. They're no different than you and I. It's the culture. It's the paradigm. It's the approach. It's a bold move to go out and actually radically transform. And it's not to say that there aren't aspects of Unilever's business that are, are fundamentally unsustainable. Yes, there are. But they're transforming. Interface, 
I don't think there's any point in me talking about interface or stealing your thunder, Kelly. You're going to cover that later. Suffice to say, um, it's up there. You've noticed I've, I've used a new brand as well. Yep. Yep. Uh, Puma recently measured all of their externalities, or they measured all of their costs, social and environmental. It was an interesting exercise, and to be honest with you, you know, s s some of the maths is, you know, there's a, a number of assumptions in there. It's not sort of perfect. And yet, what it, what it gave them was not just a handle on where all these potential costs were. When they started looking at the issues, social and environmental impacts, they recognised that there were immense opportunities for them to adapt, to create value for their future business. Interesting. Finally, Nike. I had the pleasure of meeting and working with Dawn Vance, um, inspirational business lady. Um, she's the head of global logistics. She said, and she puts it very succinctly, organisations have three options. One, hit the wall. Two, optimise and delay hitting the wall. Or three, redesign for resilience. Many of us in business are optimising and delaying hitting the wall, tweaking the existing business model and slowing down the inevitable car crash. Quite a lot of sustainable business is about that. Okay, so redesigning for resilience, radically redesigning for resilience. What I talk about in the book is this shift from the firm of the past to a firm of the future. Organisations that will be around in years to come, that actually thrive in volatility. Seek out opportunities in these challenging times. Shifting from this hierarchical, monolithic, top-down, siloed, atomised structure of business that we all know and love today, which is more suitable for the industrial era. And don't get me wrong, there's many qualities of this business that, that, that business people should be proud of. Stability, predictability, control, etc. And yet on their own, those qualities are wholly inadequate to deal with the level of volatility that we're now faced with. This is a business inspired by nature, one that works like a living organism in nature, because of course we are part of nature. An interdependent vibrant business that's adaptive and responsive to its environment. Nature has actually been dealing with dynamic change for over 3.8 billion years. So the more that we excite our vital bond, we ignite our senses with nature, the more we actually realise that the answers to our pressing challenges are all around us in nature and also our own human nature. So we're shifting from this old-school linear approach to dog-eat-dog -dog competition, supply chains, competing at every linkage in the chain, to webs, interconnected systems. Leadership itself is changing. Leaders are having to change and transform their approach from this predictable, mechanistic paradigm to one that is far more about empowering and facilitating and allowing others to adapt to change. Now, this is an interesting slide I slipped in here. Um, who's come across this before? A couple from over there. Some people call it the lazy eight, but it's, it's, it's called the adaptive cycle, whatever you want to, um, to call it, really. It doesn't matter. Um, but I don't know why, but maybe society, I don't know what it is, but we, we, we're uncomfortable, partly we're uncomfortable with change, and we're certainly uncomfortable with talking about death. And yet, you know, it's, it's inevitable. You know, I think we all know that, that death and change are inevitable in life. Often we've probably been taught at school or, or um, at college that, that, that um, nature goes through these stages of succession. From bare land, pioneering species, weed species, to shrubland, then to mature forest, steady state. Likewise in business. Innovation, entrepreneurialism, leading to growth in the market, leading to conservation and preservation. Unfortunately, we miss out a vital half of the equation. This bit here, this radical innovation, this release, fundamental. Whether that be on a personal level, as us, as, as leaders, as individuals, constantly transforming ourselves, or whether that be us working in teams, in organisations, business ecosystems, or our economy. 
were busy pumping quantitative easing. It was 375 million, and now I think it's over 400 billion pounds into a system to conserve it, not to change it, not to radically innovate, which, of course, all it will do is just make this loop harsher. So, firm of the future. Now, this isn't, um, this isn't saying this is how businesses should be. I mean, it's, it's, it's in part an ideal. It's like a, a navigation set to, to drive towards. And we've been talking on the course about how to use um, certain principles, certain uh, dynamic um, characteristics to move towards this. And it's the act of transformation with ourselves, with our businesses, that's important here. But I, I, I'll just quickly talk through this um, to give it context. Resilience, often seen as the holy grail within business at the moment. Organisations that are decentralised, that are distributed and that are diverse. They are innately resilient. It, of course, flies in the face of monoculture structures. Optimising rather than maximising. Balancing economies of scale with economies of scope. Yes, it's, scale is important and it comes with some benefits, yet it comes at the expense of scope. So you need to find the right balance. And that balance, that, that, that harmonic, might be different depending on the situation. Adaptiveness, being opportunistic to the environment around you, adapting and seeking out opportunities and going with those and celebrating the change that's happening. And systems-based. So as well as just systems thinking, actually systems being being in systems and working in ecosystems. And then values-led. So often in business, what we do is we tend to um, use governance as a way of control. So it's a bit like a building. We put more and more effort into the scaffolding holding up the building. And so much that we put into that that, that it becomes about the scaffolding which detracts from the building itself. What we're talking about here is where governance is like uh, the nylon going through your necklace. You don't see it. It's there. It holds it together. Values that run through an organisation. And finally, you could argue perhaps the rock, the bedrock of which a firm of the future is built, is life supporting, working with nature, with the grain of life itself, encouraging life through our activities, not just reducing our harm. It's a complete fallacy to think that business should just be about reducing its harm or its impact. Actually, creating value in all senses of the word. Net positive has been a, uh, a phrase used in business, so some, some businesses are starting to grapple with this. So, for example, Kingfisher Group in the UK here are talking they've come out with a net, uh, net positive plan. How can they actually give more back in terms of activities to society and the environment, um, as well as economic? Um, so that's, um, but also this concept of restorative as well, moving from... Um, the, into a new economic paradigm. So fundamentally, this is a, a paradigm shift that we're talking about here. And what I'm going to quickly do is just give you a little flavour of this, partly because, you know, there's, 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 there's students here, so I want to put a little bit of a flesh on the bone rather than just um, cut across the top. Places. In reality, it's not structured, but I, I, I use that to help explain what we're talking about here. So places, so in, in, in the places that, w that we live and that we operate, um, often, for many years, people have been taking inspiration from nature, and yet the pre prevailing paradigm is that you build things as assets um, to create money, um, to create a stream of revenue, rather than understanding how they work with their environment, how do they help the well-being of the people inside them. So there are, fortunately, good um, architect firms like Arup and Hock. Um, that are embracing this concept of what they call intelligent buildings that, that assimilate, that work with their environment. give you an example. In Harar, in, in Zimbabwe, there are two um, high-rise high um, uh, blocks, uh, mixed, mixed purpose, residential and offices, um, both next to each other. And one um, uses 80% less energy, and the people um, say that they're far more happier. Their level of well-being is improved. They prefer working there, they prefer living there. What's the difference? One is actually designed, inspired by termites' mounds, believe it or not, which regulate their temperature naturally. That's what they do. So you're looking at the design of how they can use natural airflows, they can use natural ventilation and heating, and light, etc. Makes the place more enjoyable to be in, uses less energy. It's just good business sense. Moving up here to products. There's been a lot of talk recently, and now in the UK with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, etc., you've got cradle-to-cradle -cradle concepts, 
Um, you've got this, this closed loop concept. So a lot of that is, is now becoming embedded in the approach to products. What's also happening is the shift from products to services. Do we actually need products? Well, of course you do. Isn't that the fundamental uh, approach of our business paradigm? And yet there are businesses out there questioning why. Why do we build in obsolescence, which is actually good for our business model, when we know it's, it's just inherently stupid? So an example there would be uh, Xerox, uh, the printers. Um, does Schumacher want to be an owner of a printer? When you start a business, do you really want to be an owner of, of, of carpets and printers? Are these things that you decided to be or just that you have to become because that's how the model works? Some chaps um, took um, the Xerox engineers out into nature to have a profound experience. And on their way back, um, this was in, in, in North America, on their way back they took them past, they cleverly passed a landfill site um, where there just happened to be fragments of Xerox printers. And these guys had a, a very profound experience. They had had the whole awakening of, of, of nature and being part of nature and, and what that really felt like, like a Ray Anderson experience that he had. And then was thinking, oh my God, we're, we're part of this destruction. And they said about that, what separated them from people who had experiences to people who actually do something in business is really important because they then set about making real change happen in a multinational organisation. You hire printing services from them. You don't buy printers. It's their responsibility as an organisation to make those printers as effective as possible, as sustainable as possible. They run that service and you hire a quality of service. Their whole business model has been changed they gain much more customer value as a result, a longer tenure, it's a more resilient business model, etc., etc. Processes. So, you know, in terms of materials, we can get our head around that, closed looping, industrial ecology as a concept has been around for many years. Marks and Spencers have opened up a plant recently here in the UK based on industrial ecology principles. But where it's interesting is also talking about information, informational processes between people. And we've been talking a little bit about that on the course this week. So I'll give you an example to bring it alive. Adnams, a, uh, a small brewery here in the, in the UK, on the, on the East Coast. They um, had um, a sort of values-led organisation where everybody sort of worked together and came up with ideas, all knew what was going on in the business and were very passionate about it and got the job done. A, a, a group of management consultants, believe it or not, came along and advised them uh, just before the downturn, that they would be much more e efficient if they broke their teams down into functions. HR, sales, marketing, supply chain, etc. Because that's how things are done. They're more efficient and effective, you control things better. Ba -ba -bum. So they did it. Why not? That's what they'd been advised to do. People on their board were telling them, yes, of course, it's, it's the way forward. Within a year, they knew something was awry. The downturn was hitting them. There was something wrong with the business. It felt wrong. Fortunately, whether they were small enough or they were, had, the values were so innate within them, they could feel it. They knew something was amiss. People were starting to compete, almost, <laughs> between these departments. And certainly people weren't talking. They needed management structures to communicate between them. It just it felt all wrong. And they were certainly re reducing their adaptability, their adaptiveness, their ability to sense and respond. They had the confidence to change back in the middle of the downturn. They converted back to their model of just working as processes, cyclical, as nature does. Up to people. Now, this is outside the realms of traditional biomimicry. Yeah, and now, of course, you know, there's, there's examples of us taking direct inspiration from nature in terms of leadership. Geese formations, for example, who rotate their leaders. Um, def lots of examples in business of, of, uh, of how we can take inspiration from so networks and fungi and so on. Uh, this is more. This is looking at human nature itself, our authentic human nature in business. How do we lead from the heart? How do we actually be authentic in how we go about our business with a sense of purpose, which brings us to the, the final piece, that sense of purpose in business, that galvanising mission uh, that pulls people together in these volatile times. So this, of course, is an emergence, it's a transformation, and we're going to hear a bit about how that happens in practice and some of the, the swings and roundabouts uh, from Kelly. But, you know, a lot of sustainable business focused at measuring, monitoring, controlling and reducing, fundamentally important, 
And it has to be done to understand. It's a bit like, as you say, slowing the bus that's going, um, going in the wrong direction. You need to slow it down first in order to change direction. So there's nothing wrong with that. And yet it's moving down this direction. So someone like a Unilever is actually try, starting to try and radically transform aspects of their business, whilst still keeping a hold on the existing paradigm. Startups, some of them, are lucky enough to be able to start over here. This is the transformation that's happening. Businesses attaining positive. If you go onto LinkedIn, which I, I think Peter mentioned LinkedIn a couple of times, if you're lucky enough to have enough time to, to play on LinkedIn, uh, there are many discussions defining sustainability. So often, and, that, and that's great, and it's really healthy to have those discussions, yet so often we miss the vital <laughs> foundation, which is real sustainability has to be in harmony with nature. So just to summarise, and thank you all very much for being um, so attentive, uh, uh, a business inspired by nature is one where the purpose, people, processes, products and places are inspired by and in harmony with nature. Where business helps the reconnection of ourselves to our own authentic nature and the world around us, to life itself. Business as a force for good, where we help rather than hurt. And it's a shift in paradigm. Oops.